Thanks, Thank you. Thanks very much. I honestly felt that Nigel was talking about somebody else then. I just sat down there enjoying it, settling into my seat and thinking, who is this person that Nigel's talking about? So thank you very much indeed for that very, very kind introduction, Nigel. <coughs> That's a good start, isn't it? There we go. So thanks very much also to the friends of Trebus Botanic Garden. Uh, it really is lovely to get an invitation from them to come and talk to everybody tonight. Nigel's mentioned Len Beer and the legacy of Len Beer at Treborth. <clears throat> and indeed, for me, as a young student here, these lectures, these very lectures, were a source of inspiration and stimulation for me. I remember many botanists from abroad coming here and talking about their travels in China, for example, exotic places all, all the way around the world. And I never thought as a young student that I would have the opportunity to come here uh, and talk to, the, uh, talk to a, an audience tonight. So it is really, really wonderful to, to, to be here tonight. Now, as Nigel <coughs> has sort of indicated, and as the title suggests, um, little puddy cats. Cats are going to feature a little bit in the talk tonight. Uh, and I'm going to be throwing a few of these cats into flocks of pigeons, because that's the sort of thing that we like doing at the moment. As the title says, I'm going to start challenging some of those perceived wisdoms that exist in conservation, some of those things that we maybe take for granted. And this is something that plant life has been <coughs> looking at and developing over the past few years. <coughs> now, I'm going to take you on a, a, little, a little sort of wander around possibly a corner of northwest Anglesey. <coughs> we can have a look at some sand dunes. Sorry, my throat's going here. Just take a glass of <clears throat> Imagine yourselves on a, a little walk this evening looking at some sand dunes, for example, <clears throat> then going on to some woodland and then having a look at some, uh, some nice uh, flowery meadows. So I'm going to take you on a little walk around the countryside and in each one of these places I'm going to stop and get us to think about what's actually going on with these places and what we're we doing with them. Now for so many years we've, we've when we've seen a rare plant, the reaction is always to stick a cage on top of it and cage these things in. And indeed, I was chatting uh, with somebody tonight who's just back from Israel and was saying that a population of, of rare irises has declined because it's been fenced off to protect it. And that's exactly the sort of thing that we're trying to challenge here. Now, on each one of those habitats, sand dunes, woodland and grassland, I could probably talk for a whole hour. I'm aware that, Nigel, we've taken up quite a lot of time already, so we need to <laughs> really get a move on with this. <laughs> um, but what I, don't, what I don't want to come across is uh, a little bit of a grumpy old botanist. I'm actually 44 now, Nigel, so I think I'm in the realms of, of grumpy old botanist. Uh, but I do hope that you find it sort of stimulating uh, and thought-provoking, uh, and if that doesn't do the job, then at least there's the raffle at the end, so you can look forward to that. So as Nigel said, who, who are we? Well, we, are, we like to describe ourselves as, as you know, the RSPB, but without the flappy, feathery, or tweety little bits that goes with the RSPB. We were once asked, uh, a, rather odd or, uh, a rather odd meeting that we went to, how would we as an organisation describe ourselves if we were on a speed dating evening? Not that I've ever in my life been on a speed dating evening, but if we were going speed dating, how would we describe plant life? Well, of course, we are breathtakingly beautiful. I'm not talking about the staff at that point, I'm talking about the subject matter that we deal with. Nothing else in, in, in the countryside can capture, or can, you know, we represent the most attractive, the most gorgeous uh, uh, sort of life that exists in our countryside. As with any good relationship, yeah, you just can't live without us. Yeah, you're stuck with us. Um, plants with their chlorophyll are the only things that capture sunlight, pull it into their leaves, turn it through this marvellous mechanism of photosynthesis into sugars, and then pump that sugar through the rest of the food web. As David Attenborough once put it, ultimately, I love this little quote, ultimately, plants fuel the diversity of life on Earth. They're the things that capture that energy and, and get the rest of the world working. You really, really can't work without us, uh, live without us. And finally, we are also yeah, a little bit spiky. Yeah, sometimes we tend to step outside of the box, cause a few arguments, ruffle a few feathers, and challenge the way that we do things, as you see, you will see tonight. 
Now, as Nigel mentioned, we're a membership charity, about 8,000 members, membership forms at the front if you want to join us. Um, more members are always welcome. We've got about 45 members of, of staff. Uh, we're 25 this October, so we're only 25. We're a young organisation, you know, especially compared to the likes of, of the RSPB. 45 members of staff. Half of those are, are sort of scattered in various locations across the countryside. Um, but the other half are based here in our headquarters in Salisbury in Wiltshire, which is where I'm from originally. It's quite a large office to heat. Um, <laughs> it does get a bit chilly in the winter, but at least we've got a direct line to the man at the top, so we can <laughs> sort a few things out. Now, we're not a large landowning organisation. Uh, unlike people like the National Trust and indeed the RSPB, we don't own an awful lot of land. But we do own around 23 nature reserves scattered across the country, a total of around 1,800 hectares. And this is Kai Tanabulch, which some of you may know, uh, up on the hillside above uh, Klonogvau, a small village just outside Carnarvon. And a stunning place when the sun shines. I think this is the one day I've been there when the sun has shone. Uh, but it's absolutely beautiful bay, uh, views across uh, Carnarvon Bay. And you can see in there hundreds, indeed thousands there, a profusion of these orchids, greater butterfly orchids, uh, flowering up in, in, in that reserve. But we don't just deal with flowering plants. We're, we're plant life and we deal with plants in that, that widest possible context. So we also work on things like bryophytes, these wonderful mosses and, and liverworts that we do so well uh, in Wales. Wales has one of the, for its size, proportionately the largest population of bryophytes we think anywhere in the world. If you put all the bryophytes and lichens together, we've, we've nearly got as many as they have in Texas alone. Uh, magnify that up to the size of the United States, and we really do do our, our bryophytes very, very well. This is something called Taylor's flapwort. That's the red, the red one. Uh, in the middle of the photograph there, a very rare bryophyte of, of, of western bogs. And we also do an awful lot of work uh, on lichens, these fantastic amalgamations or symbioses of, 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 of an algae and a fungus. Uh, this is, uh, I do have a favourite lichen. This is my favourite lichen. This is red-eyed shingle lichen, and it's one of these uh, wonderful lichens of what's called the Celtic rainforest, the rainforest that's found all the way up the west coast of, of, uh, of Britain, all the way up into, into Scotland. Uh, and this is a, a very a particularly rare species. It was uh, thought to be extinct in Wales uh, until my colleague Dave Lammercraft found it, a uh, tiny little piece of it growing in a woodland just outside Gantluid. So they're the lichens that we lo look after, but we also look after fungi. And these are some of these fantastic... Uh, Debbie's in the audience. This is a uh, fantastic scarlet wax cap, uh, one of these beautiful, beautiful meadow wax caps, a fungus that lives, lives out in the meadows uh, and is not actually a plant at all. It's more closely related fungi, more closely related uh, to animals. They're in a kingdom of their own. They're not actually plants at all. We actually get into an awful lot of trouble when we call them plants, so I do tend to try and be very careful and, and uh, describe them as, as plants and fungi. I think because we work on such a, a wide variety of organisms, this whole sort of base of the ecosystem, um, I think it really gives us a, a very broad view of how habitats work. Um, literally, we, we are working from the ground up, and I think that does tend to give us a slightly different perspective on habitats, the countryside, and the way our world works. Habitats are plants. That's what they are. If you think of a woodland or a heathland or a grassland or a meadow, you're visualising landscapes that are literally constructed of different plants. You've got a physical structure there, tall bits and short bits, bushy bits and open bits. Uh, you've got different resources of food. Some are in flower, some are not in flower, becoming available throughout the year. And a delicate balance between all the species that are there. So our countryside, the fabric, the tapestry of our countryside, we've got some tapestries here tonight, the tapestry of our countryside is made up from plants. Now, I'm not saying that plants are the be-all and end-all of our habitats. Of course, they're not. But they're what we like to describe as the fundamental building blocks of our countryside. They're the things that, that put everything together. So if we're trying to restore and protect and conserve all the other wildlife that exists out there, uh, we say that we need to pay a little bit more attention to these fundamental building blocks. 
So let's start with a look at one of these habitats. And I don't know if some of you sort of came through the hail and possibly I thought it was going to start snowing at one time tonight, that torrential downpour just before the evening. It's a cold night, so strip off, get your bikinis on and we'll go to the beach. I thought we'd start under the sunshine, you know, imagine yourselves with uh, an ice cream, building some sandcastle, sandcastles and we'll have a look at high summer. Oh, no, OK. Oh. <laughs> Okay, that's not summer, that's a, obviously a Christmas tree. But there is a link, and a very intimate link, between Christmas trees and sand dunes. Every year, various organisations put out an appeal, and it's normally covered on the one show, um, that people are trying to collect their Christmas trees, their old and unwanted Christmas trees. Now, last year, this was done by, uh, the home, uh, by home Base and the National Trust. And they put out this appeal for everybody to bring down their Christmas trees. And what should we start doing with the Christmas trees? Well, these were taken out to uh, Formby, the Formby Dunes at Lancashire, which is where this picture was taken. And the idea is that we are trying to stabilise and protect our sand dunes. So what people do is bung the Christmas trees at the front of the sand dunes. And the wind then coming in from the sea that's bearing the sand with it uh, is slowed down by these Christmas trees, and as you can see here, already down at the bottom, you're starting to get some sand piling up. We're starting to stabilise the sand dune and stop that sand moving around. It helps it to deposit the sand. Now, this is something that we've actually been trying to do for, for many, many years, stabilising sand dunes and stopping the sand moving around. For decades, we've spent a huge amount of money uh, on marum, uh, planting marum grass all over our sand dunes. Uh, and the idea is that this has got deep rhizomes underneath the sand that are spreading out in all directions. And as soon as this sand gets deposited on top of the marum, it's got this very strange uh, behaviour that it starts growing. It stimulates these rhizomes to start growing. So the more sand is deposited on top of the marum, the more it starts growing. So the more we stabilise our dunes and the more we stop that nasty sand moving around. But let's just take a little step back at this point and think about what sand dunes actually are. And I like to take often uh, inspiration from artists and see what their, what their interpretation of a landscape is, what it actually means to them, because they try to capture the essence of a landscape. If you Google, I'm going to use Google quite a lot in this, in this talk, if you Google dune landscape, you come up with lots of pictures like this, wonderful pictures. And in this picture, there's a great feeling of openness and, and of space, uh, a, lot of, a lot of freedom there in the landscape, if you like. Or take another example. This is actually in the Netherlands, a slightly more modern painting. Uh, again, you've got this open, this feeling of openness, lots of bare sand. I hope you can see where this is going. So artists seem to be associating dunes with open, bare sand, and we do. Yeah, that's where you'd like to go and, and, and put, roll your blanket out. It's that warm dune uh, that you like having your, your little picnic in amongst the dunes. So it's sparsely vegetated. It's open. So let's come back closer to home. Um, some of you might recognise this. This is a, an aerial photograph of Newborough Warren uh, over on the uh, coast of Anglesey. Fantastic place for, for, for plants. I remember going there with Nigel many times. This is an aerial photograph of Newborough Warren taken in 1955. Um, now, the light areas on this picture are open, bare sand. And the dark areas are green vegetation, where the vegetation is. Um, what I'd like you to do is just picture, keep that picture in your mind, and particularly note how much of that bare, open sand there is now. Because the next slide is the situation, exactly the same view, in 2006. So the loss of bare open sand is absolutely astonishing. As well as the conifer plantation at the top, which is a whole other subject, I thought, shall I, shall I broach the conifer plantation? <laughs> Maybe we'll do that in the question time. But uh, basically, with, with, with uh, uh, you know, the, the amount of grass on this dune, I mean, the contrast between those two is absolutely astonishing. And, of course, this is what we've been trying to achieve. 
open sand moves around. It's very inconvenient. It gets in your sandwiches. It covers up your tacky beachfront cafe where you want to have an ice cream. So we've done our best to lock it down, to, to freeze it and, and to hold it in place because we don't like that inconvenience. We're more comfortable with a situation like this where, frankly, we're in control. Now, this is the perceived wisdom of sand dunes, is that they are fragile ecosystems and they need to be protected in this way. We need to stop the sand moving around and keep them where they are. We plant grass on them, we get them grazed, and we stop this, and we, we keep people off them. How many times do you remember, don't walk on the dunes or you'll co cause one of these blowouts where the sand's moving around again. So what's the actual result of this? Well... Across all the Welsh dunes, as you can sort of interpret from that picture of, of Newborough, um, the amount of bare sand has decreased astonishingly. Uh, it's decreased by 86% across all of our Welsh dunes, so that now uh, open bare sand in our dunes accounts for just 3% of the area of dunes. There's just 3% open sand left. However, many of the species that particularly love to live on sand dunes, they need, if not entirely, but for part of their life, this open sand as part of their life cycle. They need to have open sand. And I'm not just talking about plants here. We've got some animals here, some insects. Uh, that's a sand-tailed digger wasp uh, and darkling beetle and two uh, little bryophytes, petalwort in the top corner and June bryum down here. These are all things that need at uh, some point in their, their life cycle, this open dune sand. So as the, as the uh, open sand disappears, these dis things are disappearing as well. The, the biggest interest in sand dunes is actually the invertebrates, and the invertebrates have, have just disappeared from, from the Welsh, Welsh dunes. But perhaps the most famous plant that, that's under threat and has disappeared from our Welsh dunes is this little fella, the uh, little fen orchid. Uh, there's a bit of an orchid theme running through this as well tonight. I'm a bit of an orchid fan, so uh, you'll see quite a few orchids this, this evening. This is fen orchids, and it's associated with open dune slacks, the very young dune slacks uh, that have been recently scooped out by the wind and moved away, so it's those young dune slacks. Currently, this plant is at is in imminent risk of extinction. It's what we call uh, critically endangered, which is the highest level of threat. Now, the Welsh dunes, this is down in South Wales, supported 90% of the UK population. In fact, if I'm honest, the world population, because this is a variety only found in, in, in Britain, uh, of this European protected species. But since the 1980s, which isn't that long ago, um, it's been lost from six of the sites that it grows in Wales, including Pendine Burrows and just as recently as 2006, which really isn't very long ago, from Whitford Burrows in Gower. It now only grows at Kenfig Burrows uh, in Glamorganshire. And back there, in the early 1980s, there were 10,000 plants of, of, of fen orchid. And every year, dedicated botanists would go out and count how many uh, flowering plants there were. 10,000 flowering plants. Last year, bit of an easier job, there were 40. Only 40 of these plants are left in Kenfig. <coughs> so we've had to do something about this, and we've had to do something very big and very different and very radical. We've had to reassess what we're actually doing with sand dunes and looking at that whole process of what are sand dunes doing. We've got to try and re-stimulate those natural processes of sand moving around the sites, around Kenfig. So this is something that's called dune rejuvenation. And it basically involves getting the bulldozers in, which is basically botanists playing with very big toys, because botanists do like to play with very big toys. Now, for the last three years, we've been working with the Natural Resources Wales, uh, who have funded uh, a, a programme of work down at Kenfig to get the sand moving. Um, when I talk about sand moving, we're talking about sand moving on a big scale. So it's big bulldozers and big diggers working on very big areas of sand. In fact, we can fly up into the air and see the extent of the sand that we're excavating. This has taken three years to excavate. That's a road going across the centre there. Yeah, we did leave that. We thought that was fairly important. But the idea here is, is something very, very simple. We're geomorphing the dunes and we're reprofiling them. 
The idea is to puncture a hole in the front of that dune and actually get the wind then to do the process for us, to do the work for us. So you create these what are called mega blowouts and basically then when the sand dries out you get the wind moving in and it then starts moving this sand out and away and into the inner parts of the sand dune. And in that way the whole dune is regenerated. You start getting mobile dunes moving across. You start getting these open areas where these rare plants and, and insects uh, like to live. As well as that, on a big scale, on a slightly smaller scale, we've also engineered these large dune scrapes. Uh, smaller areas, shallower areas, near where the fen orchid uh, exists at the moment, in the hopes that the seeds will just hop across and come into these newly excavated areas as well. And all of this work is starting to, to pay off. I'm sure cavernous crystal wort never thought it would get its five seconds of fame, but it's about to get its five seconds of fame. This is a tiny little liverwort, uh, cavernous crystal wort, and it's dis it was discovered last year in a dune scrape, one of these scrapes that was made the year before. Now, the importance of this is that it hadn't been found at Kenfig uh, since 1936. So it was just there, waiting under the sand in that place for somebody to come along, scrape the sand away. It's an opportunistic species, up it popped, and there it is. So there, you've had your five minutes of fame, on to the next thing. But it's also the fen orchids are now starting to respond as well. And last year, uh, seedlings were discovered in one of the scrapes that had been uh, uh, excavated in 2010. 20 seedlings. Not many, not many, just 20 tiny small seedlings appeared. But if you remember what I said before, 40 plants in total were seen at Kenfig. That's half of the population of, of, of fen orchid down at Kenfig last year. So we're, we know this works. In fact, a lot of this work has been uh, pioneered in the Netherlands. A huge programme of work over there to engineer dunes on a very large scale. And they're coming to a dune system near you. So we're starting to roll this out along some of the sand dunes in the south coast of Wales and indeed Newborough. We've started doing this sort of work at Newborough as well to get that sand moving. Okay, that's sand dunes. Let's move off the sand dunes and into another habitat and turn our attention to woodland. Now, who likes trees? Let's have a show of hands in the audience. Who likes trees? Is anybody not going to put their hand up? Yeah, a few people. Yeah, a couple of people have not put their hand up. Most of us love trees. Uh, it's a habitat that we, or it's a, a thing that we feel passionately about. People are passionately in love with their trees. This is beech woods. These are beech woods down in the south of England, uh, which always astonish me when you notice the people at the bottom there, tiny little people. You get an idea of actually just how big these, these beech trees are. Now, like I say, we feel passionately about our woods. They're, they're woven into our culture, into our history, and into our national psyche, even. One of our greatest folk heroes lived in them. We hug them. We climb into them as children and sometimes as adults as well. And if we feel that they're threatened, we will chain ourselves up to them. When the government in England, a couple of years ago, I think it was last year, threatened to sell off the public forest estate... Over half a million people signed a petition online to stop that being done. They felt that their woodlands were going to be taken away from them and it motivated them to do something. That was the largest sort of expression of love in a habitat, I think, that's ever happened uh, in Britain. And yes, Errol Flynn was by far the best uh, Robin Hood. <laughs> Most of all, though, we like to plant trees. There's something really visceral, something inside us that makes us feel, I've got to plant a tree. There's endless calls for saving our woodland, and we need more trees, uh, stimulated, I think, through sort of rash comparisons with the amount of woodland that's left on, in, in Europe, which is always going to be more wooded than Britain, and a largely sort of imagined wild wood that used to extend from coast to coast. There's little evidence that it ever actually did. Planting trees makes us feel like we're, re two things, reconstructing the past and also making an investment in the future as well. It helps us feel like we're doing our bit and playing our part in things like stopping global warming and saving wildlife. But in fact, 
we have a rather strange relationship with trees and woodland. We've become a little bit fixated on the trees themselves. So the perceived wisdom for woodland is that we need more trees and more trees and more trees and more trees. We suggest there are two problems with this view that's developed. Firstly, despite all of that rhetoric, we actually have an awful lot of woodland in this country. Um, more than at any time, in, at the moment now, than any time since the 1350s, which was way before Robin Hood lived. So he would come here and he would think, wow, you've got more trees than when I was around, which is something quite interesting to, to think about. It's also one of the few habitats, the priority habitats, that's increasing in Britain. Whilst things like meadows, calcareous grassland and heathland are actually decreasing or staying at the same level, woodland, priority woodland, that important habitat that we want to protect, is increasing. And a category of woodland, for example, called beech and yew woodland has increased since 2002 by 35%. We're getting lots of woodland. But despite this, and rather than focusing on all of these other interesting and, and, and wonderful habitats, government just ploughs ahead and sets more targets for planting yet more and more trees. So in Wales, the Welsh government has said by 2030, 2031, we want 100,000 hectares of extra woodland. Now that works out at 5,000 hectares of woodland being planted every year. 5,000 hectares of woodland being planted. That's more than some of those priority habitats than exist, that exist in their entirety. So where does all this woodland go? Where are we going to put it? Well, in many cases, farmers are being, to, are being encouraged to plant this woodland on their land. They're getting grants to do so, and generous grants to do so. Now, if you're a farmer and you want to plant some woodland, you're not going to plant it on your best bit of land, where your cows get the fattest or where you grow the, the, the most cereals. You're going to put it on your most unproductive bit of land. It's what we call the marginal land that's on the edges uh, of, of your farm. It's no good for crops and grazing. Unfortunately, those, though, these are often the very wildflower-rich meadows, uh, wet rush pastures, and even, as in this case, heathland, open heathland, that are getting planted. They're the places where these wildflowers and farm wildlife remain, and they're getting planted with trees. And we know of many cases where, where, where this is happening. Of course, once they're planted there, within a few years, all of that heather will have gone underneath the trees. The second issue is, that comes from this fixation on planting is that it takes away attention from what we really need to be doing, which is managing those woodlands that we've got at the moment. In the past, woodland was an integral part of every single farm. It was, it was part of the fabric of the farm. It provided shelter for, for livestock. Cattle and, and feeding livestock would go into the woodland. Pollards and coppices would be, would be harvested regularly. The, the leaves off the coppices would have been used as fodder for the animals, as well as obviously using timber uh, products for, for fencing and for building. And of course, it supplied a sustainable source of wood fuel and charcoal for the farm. But today, none of that happens. Woodland instead is fenced off because the best thing you can do for woodland is to remove the grazing and leave it alone. That's the best thing that you can do for woodland. 70 years ago, 50% of our woodland was unmanaged. Today, 97% of our woodland is unmanaged. It's just left alone. So that's the perceived wisdom. The best thing we can do for woodland is fence it off and don't touch it. Once that's been happened though, once that's happened though, all sorts of dark things start to happen. And in fact, dark is exactly what happens. This is what your woodlands quickly turn into. The canopy closes over and the light disappears. Now, contrary to what you'd expect, a dark wood actually harbours very, very little light. Now, I'm going to do a little bit of a science bit now. Uh, I see some students in the audience. Have any of you heard of the Ellenberg scales? The Ellenberg, have they done Ellenberg scales? Yes, I, yes Nigel's nodding, you should have heard of Ellenberg scales. 
So Alan Berg was a, a brilliant botanist uh, working many years ago. Basically what he did was to take uh, a range of plants, a range of native plants, and look at the different characteristics that, that they've got. Do some of them like uh, wet ground compared to dry ground? Do some of them like uh, calcareous ground compared to acid ground? And in this case, do some of them prefer light opposed to dark? So basically this is a, a little graph that shows you which plants, the number of plants that grow in the light and the dark. And on the scale closest to me is dark. Zero is completely dark. Over there, the audience on that side of the auditorium, you're in bright sunshine. You're in full, full sunshine over there. Now, this is the number of woodland plants that like to grow under those different light conditions. Now, you might expect that in a woodland, all of those plants would be down at this end. So Herb Paris, for example, is actually Ellenberg light value number three. It can take quite a bit of shade, but another woodland plant, spreading bellflower, is right up at number eight. It actually likes to grow in quite sunny places within the woodland. But most of the plants are in fairly light conditions. Ah, I hear you cry, but what about all those mosses and lichens and liverworts? They like living in the dark, don't they? No, they like living in the light as well. Plants need light. We have to have light. The most mosses, I love that, rock pocket moss. That should be a name for a pop group, I reckon. Um, <laughs> most mosses like to live in the light just as much as, as vascular plants do. Just to give you another example of a light-loving plant, this is green hound's tongue, uh, one of our rarest woodland plants. This has been recorded in the, in the past from 43 different sites in southern England, but is now only found in eight different woodlands scattered in, in Surrey, Gloucestershire and Oxfordshire. So it's a very, very rare plant. It's critically endangered. This has declined because the canopies have closed over in those woodlands. It can't thrive anymore. So what this needed in order to bring it back was a little bit of disturbance. Thank you, Michael Fish, for the great storm of 1987. So that slammed into the country in southern England in October. Hurricane forced up to 121, uh, 120 miles an hour, and 15 million trees were downed in that period. Greenhound's tongue absolutely loved it, and it just went berserk. In these open areas that had been formed, especially with the soil disturbed, with these trees falling over, it came up in its thousands in its thousands. It thrived and it loved this open light conditions again. Now as the woodland canopies are closing back over again, it's disappearing. And it's not just plants either. Uh, take one of our wonderful native uh, uh, wild birds, um, pied flycatcher. This has declined by 50% uh, in Britain, uh, sorry, in Wales in the last 25 years, mainly because that, that sort of understory, the shrub layer uh, that uh, has grown up. This little bird likes to fly through open oak woodlands. It likes to have its little roots to fly through, through the trees, and as these get congested uh, and, and overgrown, it moves out. Also, things like this beautiful pearl-bordered fritillary. Uh, a woodland butterfly, it lives on, or its caterpillars live on violets. Violets need light on the floor. So as the canopies have closed over, this has disappeared as well. 80% of these have gone since 1985, a massive decline. So we're starting to uh, uh, take this as an issue. Um, we don't want our woodlands, as we'd say, to be dark, overgrown and silent. And we're starting to challenge this view, as are other organisations as well, it must be said. So Butterfly Conservation and the RSPB as well, we've all got around this idea that these declines in this woodland wildlife is because we're allowing our uh, woodlands to become overgrown. So we're putting it into practice. Uh, I always like to get this one into the talk. Um, I tried it on the BBC once and I had to change the name. I wasn't allowed <laughs> on the BBC to say this name. I had, to, I had to call it the Latin name, which is Melitis, Melissifolia. Um, but there we go, lovely bastard balm. It's called bastard balm because it looks like a balm, but it doesn't have the scent of a balm. So it's a, a bastard balm. Um, but it's a very, very good plant for, for, for bees. It's a very nectar-rich plant. Critically endangered in Wales, only four sites left. They've all become overgrown, and we've been doing a lot of work. This is in Pembrokeshire in Pengeshley to, to chop the trees down, and this plant starts coming up again. So we need to pay as much attention to good woodland planting as we do to just, uh, sorry, good woodland management as we, we do to just planting endlessly more and more trees. And I just want to do a quick aside on that thing about planting. 
and this is utterly bonkers to me. So the idea, this disaster that we've got uh, unfolding at the moment in the British countryside uh, of ash dieback, um, it would have arrived here anyway on the air. It would have arrived in, in this country anyway. That, that's for certain. Spores would have arrived from, from, from Europe. But we've exacerbated that spread and accelerated that spread by planting trees out into the wild. I'm baffled. I don't, if somebody can explain to me why we grew up British ash trees, exported them across to Europe, grew them in nurseries where they got infected, and then brought them back to Britain and planted them out in the wild in Britain, then I can't understand that. I just find that completely incomprehensible. Ash trees are important. Ash trees are extremely important for a whole range of wildlife. A new report has just been published showing that a 1,000 species live on or are dependent on our ash trees. Uh, half of these are the lichens, again, these wonderful um, rainforest, Celtic rainforest lichens, 548 uh, lichens are dependent on ash trees. So if ash trees go, then they will go as well. The bonkers bit, the bit that doesn't make sense to me, is that ash is one of our most prolifically seeding trees. It produces abundant seed. Give it a bit of bare ground and it grows like bilio. It's a weed. We weed it out of our woodlands. So why on earth are we exporting trees and re-importing them again? It doesn't make sense. It makes sense to some organisations. It doesn't make sense to me. What we really need to be do doing and encouraging is this regeneration of native local trees. They'll have that level of variation within them that means when they're exposed to something like ash dieback, you know, we've got a natural process of selection going on, building up disease resistance. Yes, it might be that we get uh, an awful lot of tree death at the moment, but those processes of selection will mean that we'll have stronger and more resilient trees for the future if we let natural processes like this carry on. OK, let's come out of the woodland and come back into the sunshine again to our last habitat. Uh, let's have a look at some wildflowers in some wildflower meadows. At Plant Life, we obviously deal with a lot of wild flowers. Many people love wildflowers, going out into the countryside, finding them, seeing them, and trying to you know, track down wonderful images like this. But what does the term wild actually mean? What is this funny concept of, of wild? Well, again, let's turn to Google, always a help on this situation, and Google wild. If you Google wild, you get this chap. <laughs> yeah, that's quite wild. Yeah, yeah, that's very... OK, let's try again with wildflower. Let's be a little bit more specific now. So let's try wildflower. Well, yeah, you come up with usually these sort of dreamy, Magical images, remember the Timothée advert with a woman going through doing her hair like this. This is normally what you get with wildflower. Wonderful, beautiful wildflower meadow and another one like this full of orchids. This is down in uh, Oxfordshire. Wonderful display of cowslips and orchids. Beautiful wildflower meadows. And you also get images like this. OK, a few alarm bells are starting to ring for me on this one now. Is that a wildflower meadow? Mm, mm, there's two words in there that don't apply to that, wild and meadow. But you also get things like this, wildflower meadows. These are the famous wildflower meadows in the Olympic Park from 2012. OK, there's not a plant that's native to Britain in that photo. That's entirely North American species. But it just illustrates this idea of, of, of how we're getting mixed up with what wild actually means to us. Now, before I go on, I just want to clock where we are with wildflowers and wildflower meadows in particular. These ancient wildflower meadows have been lost to an alarm. I've been throwing lots of statistics at you tonight, normally up in the 90s. This is another one up in the 90s. 97% of our wildflower meadows have been destroyed since the First World War. We've lost 97% of areas that look, look, looked like this. This is actually up in Yorkshire. This is uh, Mucum Meadows in Yorkshire. Stunning example of, of this sort of diversity that you get in a meadow. As these meadows have gone, so has that rich diversity of life that goes with it. Famously, of course, pollinators, about which we're all concerned at the moment. Bumblebees, butterflies, and, and chaps like this, this lovely little hoverfly. 
but also lots of other things, beetles, you know, spiders and bugs. And to us, we talk about an experience of a meadow is as critically endangered as the meadows themselves. When you're in a meadow on a hot summer's day, you've got the grasshoppers making that wonderful evocative sound and the skylarks going off above you. It's all part of that experience that makes a meadow. So in response to this loss, in response to these things disappearing, and particularly in response to this call for doing more for pollinators, we're motivated to do something. We want to do something about that. Unfortunately, we're uh, an impatient lot, and we're not prepared to wait for anything. We want things done now, and we want to be, and we can. We can put this all right now. We can reach for that packet of wildflower seed off the shelf and sow it and we've got a meadow formed. It's easy, you just instantly have a meadow. There you go, bing, boom, next day, next, next year, you've got your meadow. Okay, these are the 12 plants that are found in the leading brand, probably the most popular brand of native wildflower meadow seed mix in Britain. I'm not gonna name who they are. Um, in order for you to establish a meadow. 12 species in their basic meadow mix. So there they all are. And it's a slightly odd mix of plants. Um, red campion and bladder campion, uh, the two campions. For me, I wouldn't associate those with a meadow at all. They're sort of hedgerow uh, disturbed uh, grassland areas. They're, they're not indicative of a meadow at all. And salad burnet, the one in the middle there, is a plant that really only grows on chalk and limestone. Yeah, you do get meadows in that situation, but it's not something that's, that's you know, it's a specialist plant, it's not, it's not a generalist. But most importantly, those meadows that I was just showing you before will often have over 100 species of flowering plants, let alone everything else, just the flowering plants, 100 species of flowering plants in them. And indeed, one of our reserves down at Lampeter, uh, Kybline Dufferin, has got over 160 different species of flowering plants. So this isn't representative of a meadow, but more importantly to me and to us is we have to ask where have these things actually come from and how have they arrived in your seed packet? Where has that seed actually come from? And this company are quite nice to actually tell you where each of these species come from in their basic meadow mix. Ten different counties across England I think we cover everything, nearly. We've got Somerset in the south. We've got Northumberland in the north. We've got uh, Cheshire across here in the, uh, in the uh, west. And right over on the east, we've got Norfolk. So we've covered the whole breadth of, of England in one little packet of seed. Now, if I was creating a meadow in Wales, that isn't the sort of thing that I would want to pop into my uh, patch of ground. This limited collection then comes from a very, very small gene pool. And it's this genetic variation that we're in danger of losing. This is one of the most important plants in a meadow. It's yellow rattle. It's what we call the meadow maker. It takes its uh, nutrients. It can photosynthesize itself, but it's what we call a hemiparasite. It taps its roots into surrounding grasses and, and, and literally starves them of nutrients. That reduces the growth of the grass and lots of other different species can, can get in there. So it's what we call the meadow maker. These are all um, yellow rattle plants from, from Britain. And just have a look through those pictures and just get an idea of how, you know, the level of variation We've got entirely yellow flowers. We've got flowers with a distinct orange tinge to them. The bracts can be completely green or they can be tinged with purple. The bracts are sometimes quite small or sometimes in this one they're quite big. Sometimes the heads are congested together. Sometimes they're spaced out. Sometimes the flowers are all the way around and sometimes the flowers are on one side of the stem. So we've got an awful lot of natural variation going on. And it's not just these plants but it's the meadows themselves. So there's many different types of meadow in Britain, but I've selected one type here called uh, a neutral grassland, an MG5 grassland, for those of you that know your, your community classifications. So lowland neutral, uh, ne uh, neutral meadow, and all of these have got um, common spotted orchid in them. But look how different they all look to each other. One with cat's ear at the top, 
The other one down here with oxide 80, and the one in the top corner over there is full of common sedge. So they're different, and that's what makes them special. And indeed, in other particular areas of, of the country, you'll get other interesting and exciting species dominating the meadow. So it might be great burnet or cowslips putting on a wonderful display, or indeed the magnificent fritillary meadows uh, in Wiltshire where I grew up. So all these plants are coming together and, and building up this idea of local character and identity. But instead, no, we want it now. We're impatient, so we go for an identikit meadow mix. We refer to it as the McDonaldization <laughs> of our countryside. We've done it to our high streets, so now let's do it to our meadows. That's fine. We're homogenizing our countryside with muck meadow mix. And this is the sort of thing that you see time and time again all over the countryside now. Yeah, it's wonderful for pollinators. Pollinators will love it. They'll come zipping in, they'll take the pollen, job done, great, tick that box, we feel good. But we're not actually looking at the inherent uh, uh, sort of magic that you get with wild plants, how they spread around the countryside, how they appear spontaneously and how they make something that's special to your particular area. It's that loss of a joy in, in an experience. Let's go back for a second to our little tiger that was at the beginning of, the, of this section. And for us, the difference is the difference that you'll see here between this chap and that chap. It's a very, very different experience. Finding a native wild plant in the wild, having got there of its own accord, done its own thing, done some bit of magic to appear there, that's what we're in danger of losing. We're also in danger of losing that species diversity, and there's a really good reason why that, that's very important. In the current jargon, people talk about ecosystem services, which is a very, very dull way of saying this sort of stuff does an awful lot for us. Okay, it captures carbon, it sucks in carbon and stores it underground. It can control rainwater, it so soaks up lots of rainwater and therefore helps control flooding. Of course, it provides nectar for, for pollinators, but it provides nectar for pollinators throughout the year and for lots of the food plants, for lots of other bugs and insects as well. And also, it can be a source of, of medicines and sometimes very valuable medicines. This is uh, uh, a field in Radnorshire, Pengkai, uh, Pengkleinenon, uh, uh, just in the Elam Valley. And this is an example of what used to be called a Kai Asputi, a hospital field. And every farm, um, no, no, probably in, uh, as far as you know, certainly in the, in, in, in the Mid Wales area, many, many farms would have and would keep a wildflower meadow separate. They wouldn't uh, uh, intensify the agriculture on there. They'd keep all of these species here because they knew if they had a sick animal, some sick livestock, once it was, uh, had been sorted out by the vet, it would go into a field like this because they knew, putting it into the hospital field, it would recover much better from its illnesses. There's something about that rich diversity of species coming into its diet that actually helps the livestock uh, improve and recover. Now, if we just lose 17%, so nearly one in five of the species from a meadow like this, we lose all of those things that I've just mentioned, all of those ecosystem services. And each plant is working in a close association with each other, complementarity, and doing their bit to provide those services at different times throughout the year and in different places as well. Now, there is a way to restore meadows and do all of this work uh, in a different way and doing it a slightly better way to do this meadow restoration much more effectively. It's a technique that's widely used by the wildlife trusts and by many uh, hay restoration programs. So there's one called Hay Time, for example, up in the Yorkshire Dales, uh, where a lot of these techniques have been, have been sort of pioneered. Through the Coronation Meadows Project, um, the Prince of Wales, who is our, our patron, has tasked Plant Life, along with the Wildlife Trusts and indeed the Rare Breeds Survival Trust, to undertake a slightly ambitious task of creating a new meadow in every county in Britain using the best seed that's available from another meadow in that county. And this is a method that we use called green hay. 
Now, it's very, very, very simple. Um, meadows need to have a cut of hay taken every year to remove the nutrients and to keep uh, things like uh, hawthorn and blackthorn and shrubs in order. So this is a natural part of keeping a meadow uh, going, is to take a hay cut. If you're taking a, a green hay, hay cut, you just do it a little bit earlier, just before all of that seed has been dropped. And basically this, again, is at Kai Tanabulch, the reserve outside Klonogvauer. And you just go in with a harvester, with a hay cutter, but instead of, you, you can bale it up, or it can just go into a little hopper like this. Now immediately then, you take this hay and you apply it to another field nearby that's been cultivated and prepared, ready for this uh, green hay. And this is a, uh, 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 well, a field just down the T-Blant, T -blant, I think it's called, just down the road from Klonogvau. Uh, you might recognise the, the landscape there, just down the valley. And this is the hay from Kaitanabulch being spread onto the meadow. So nearly in the hay like this, nearly all of those original species can be present. You get much greater diversity and much quicker establishment of these meadows. They've got the local character, they've got the local genetics of, of those plants that are nearby, uh, but more, more importantly, it's more resilient to change. It's got all of those ecosystem services kicking off straight away. But for us, there's a really important extra benefit as well, and that is that the farmer is paid for that crop of hay. So the value of the meadow is realised and it goes directly back to the farmer. It doesn't go into the hands of a seed company who go around the whole country picking one plant from one place, bulking it up at a nursery, popping it in a packet and selling it on to the consumer. We're paying farmers for the value of their wildflower meadows. And once you've done that, once you've given a wonderful ecosystem, a wonderful piece of habitat like a wildflower meadow, a value, farmers will value it more and it becomes a resource that they want to conserve and increase. You know, it becomes uh, uh, something that they want to, to conserve. This obsession with sowing seed in the countryside um, extends to other habitats too, particularly arable fields. I love this little... Uh, it's a little postcard that you can get of an iconic old uh, two ladies, Victorian ladies in a field of buttercups, and the, uh, that umbrella is enough to keep off the herbicide as it comes on them. <laughs> it's, again, I don't understand this, and I'd love somebody to explain why it is that we've spent decades hard at work. I, David Attenborough said once when the State of Nature report was launched at uh, uh, end of last year, he said, we've become very good at exterminating things from our countryside. And we, we've turned it into a fine art. We do it really, really very easily and very, very, very well. We've herbicided these wildflowers, these, these cornfield flowers, out of existence. Most, a higher number of these are on the critically endangered list compared to any other habitat in Britain. So we've got rid of them by herbiciding them away. Uh, suddenly we value them again. So we start then paying wildflower seed companies for seed, which we then sow back into the fields, and that costs the farmer money as well to sow it back into the field. So what's going on there? I just don't understand that. It's complete and utter madness. The result is that we get this again. So this is a, uh, a, an arable, a cornfield flower mix and it's a mix of corn, uh, well, corn flowers, which are blue, corn marigolds, which are yellow, poppies, obviously red, and a little thing called corn chamomile, which is the, the, the white little flower. Occasionally you get a corn cockle as well. There's one corn cockle over on the corner there, the, the little pink flower in the middle, middle there. Beautiful. But this mixture of plants never, ever exists in the wild in Britain. You just don't, it doesn't happen, it doesn't occur. Partly because these are different plants. Poppies are much happier, certainly common poppy, on lime-rich soils. Whereas corn marigold is much happier on acidic soils. So you never get them coming together. Moreover, what we're sowing as corn chamomile isn't corn chamomile. It's actually an Austrian species that the seed companies have decided look similar, we can bulk it up in Europe, shove it into our seed mixes, and we're now scattering it all over our fields uh, as corn chamomile. I don't know what that pink thing is. 
It's a sort of clovery type stuff. Ian, I don't know if you recognize it, but um, it's certainly a European species of, 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 of clover, and um, I've never seen it in Britain. So we're sowing all sorts of different things in here. Now, to me, this is a blatant disregard for the integrity of our wild plants. Take that one step further. This is a turtle dove. Now, turtle doves are, pla are plants. Turtle, no, they're not. They've got feathers. Remember that, Trevor? Birds, feathers. So, uh, turtle doves are birds of arable habitats. They like cornfield um, plants, and they spend a lot of their time foraging in stubbles, uh, picking up seed. And the RSPB, um, sorry, I shouldn't mention RSPB in person. I know there's some RSPB colleagues in the audience. But the RSPB B BP have done some work looking at what it is that uh, turtle doves like to feed on. And one of the main uh, sources of food that they feed on turns out to be this little thing in the top corner, which is common fumitry. It's a little weed of arable, arable flowers. Now, common fumitry, the clue is in the name, common, common fumitry. This is found all over the place. It's one of the most resistant of our arable plants that's left. It can actually tolerate some of these herbicides. So if you leave a field unsprayed, uh, uncultivated, left to its own devices, common fumitry will pop up and it will reappear. But the response to the fact that turtle doves like living on or need common fumitry in their diet means that the guidance and the advice from the RSPB and the campaign from them is to plant more fumitry all over the country. And I just don't get that. Why are we not saying, let's conserve the plant in order for it to deliver what it needs to deliver for the turtle dove? To me, it's upside down. And we're almost treating the countryside as a massive bird table. Farmland birds have been in decline for many, many years, and our response has been to sow all of this stuff. I mean, talking quinoa, millet, sorghum, all sorts of things are getting sown. Farmers are paying for this stuff to go into their fields as a massive bird table for the wild birds that are flying around the countryside. It doesn't work because the, they're still in decline. So our suggestion is we need to look at those native plants and see what their roles are and try and get them coming back to do it. We're hoping to raise quite a bit of a debate about this. Um, we're not saying no to planting. We're not saying no to seeding. What we're saying is that let's have a think about what we're doing. Let's try and keep the wild in wildflower and think about where that seed comes from and where we're sowing it. And is that the right thing for us to be doing? Other people feel this way. This is a sign that appeared on Twitter a couple of weeks ago, tweeted by a very famous TV botanist um, uh, of a sign up in a London park. Conservation work, this area is being sown with wildflowers. And the comment that somebody's written is, if they are sown, they are not wild. So this means something to people. It's actually resonating with, with people. There is a, a different opinion out there. And this is part of a larger thing that we're doing at Plant Life called plant proofing. And what plant proofing is, is about shifting our focus, shifting our attitude to recognize that ultimately all plants, all wildlife rather, depends on wild plants for their food, for their shelter, for the habitats in which to thrive. So when we're undertaking conservation work for any species, no matter whether it's fluffy, whether it flaps, whether it jumps, whether it hovers, whatever it does or swims, wild plants are the foundation of their survival. You know, the mantra is, if we get the wild plants right, all the other wildlife will thrive. Our countryside isn't a garden for us just to garden for the charismatic species, those things that that we like to focus on. We need to treat our wild plants as essential wild elements of our countryside, not as we say it, a pleasant wallpaper, a sort of backdrop to these more charismatic species. We're trying to bring the plants into that sharp focus of, of, of getting the attention that they deserve. Only then, only when we do that, will we see colour actually returning to our countryside only then will we begin to regain some of what we've really lost, and only then will we see a long-term and sustainable recovery 
in all of our wildlife in the countryside. Thank you very much. Yeah, so the, we, there are challenges, and that's one of the major ones. So if you go in and, and, and open up woodland, open up an old piece of coppice, you often get brambles coming back as well. So it gets overgrown, and you get a dense thicket of brambles. There's two things to say to that. Firstly, a lot, there's a lot of evidence recently to show that that's a result of nitrates accumulating in the soil is to do with uh, uh, particularly atmospheric nitrogen deposition. So we've got a richer soil than we used to have before. In the past, a coppice would have been taken off every sort of 10, 15, 20 years maybe, and that process of removing plant material from the forest would have helped to keep the soil nutrient levels down. So when it stopped, they start building up again. And the other thing is grazing. You know, we've become so scared to the point of literally fencing off all of our woodlands to put grazing animals in woodland. We've become obsessed with this idea that we need seedlings popping up all the time, every year, all over our woodlands in order to keep our woodlands go going. And we just don't. We need occasional periods of very heavy grazing to come in, and we need small, you know, lighter grazing all year round, but also these heavy periods of grazing coming in. So you know, in the past, like I said, farmers would have used their woodlands as an integral part of, of, their, of their farm. They would have kept the livestock in there at certain times, and we just don't do that anymore. So I think that combination of restarting coppicing, for example, and getting grazing animals back in, they'd get on top of the bramble situation. And then you we've just got to be more patient about these things and allow these processes to, to, to take place. Exactly, it's all part of the same thing, and we've just produced a statement on ivy um, to, again, get people to think about ivy. If you're a little bryophyte or a little lichen, ivy is death to you. But, yeah, we've got to leave ivy because everybody thinks ivy is really, really good, and, you know, that's nesting places for birds. I'm sure it is nesting places for birds, but it needs to be in moderation. The, what, we're doing, what we do is polarise the situation. So we either overgraze all of our woodlands, which was the problem a few years, you know, so, you know, in the early sort of 60s, 70s. You know, we do need to control the grazing in woodland, but we've gone to the other direction and fenced them all off and, and left them all alone. So for us, ivy is, is, is part of the same problem. It's part, part of the same situation, yeah. It's a little bit of all, all of that. The, 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 the subsidy system and the agri-environment schemes in particular have been very, very bad at driving some of these, particularly fencing off of woodlands, um, but also bad grassland management. So we have a scheme in Wales at the moment, for example, which has, uh, so this is an agri-environment scheme where farmers are paid for doing good work to manage their, their farms for wildlife. And at the moment, a farmer can be paid for what's called a low nutrient, low input grassland, which means it's starting to get back towards a meadow situation that we were with, with low levels of nutrients. Now, 
In fact, the level of nutrients that they can apply on that land, because it's low nutrients, not no nutrient, is just five kilograms less than an ordinary farmer would apply to their field. So it makes no difference whatsoever. So we're paying for bad practice, basically. And agri-environment schemes do, do another bad thing, which is take a bad bit of management, but then put it over a huge area of land. So our heathlands, for example, um, you know, we're seeing many of those species that like poached areas and short grazed areas of heathland, they're disappearing because farmers aren't allowed through their agri-environment uh, uh, agreements to put large numbers of livestock on their, their land. And you need these pulses of heavy grazing going through to get them, to get them going. So yeah, those sorts of schemes are bad. They're badly designed. We're just about to produce a woodland report, that, uh, sorry, a, a farmland report that outlines some of the problems with them. But the other thing is, I think just this, this we've, be, we've come disconnected from our landscapes and our countryside, so we don't now know how they used to work. You know, when my mum was growing up in the countryside, uh, you know, she had cowslip meadows all around her, and every farm had a little bit of meadow and a little bit of arable and a little bit of woodland to service the whole farm. But now they're doing all the same thing. They're all pasture or they're all arable. So we've lost that understanding of, of, of how the countryside works. And we've become, we've, we've frankly become lazy and impatient, and we want things happening straight away. So th this response to pollinators is absolutely absurd that we're just planting all of these mixtures in. It's great for the pollinators, but we're just not thinking about how the plants can do it for us anyway and what services they can provide for us. So I think it's a little bit of both. I think it's our ignorance, haste and stupidity and um, government schemes doing the wrong thing as well. It's a huge step change isn't likely to happen, but small, small changes are. And I think for us, the key, the, the real key, is looking at those productive landscapes, so that farming landscape where most of this wildlife has been lost from. 60% of species are in, in decline uh, across the board in, in, in Britain. And it's about looking at, looking at those particular habitats where, like with the wildflower meadows, we can make them worth looking after. We can, we can put their, their economic value back directly into the hands of the, of, of, of the farmer. The Rare Breed Survival Trust are doing this because many rare breeds have, have evolved and been bred to survive in particularly hardy conditions. So we often get these breeds, uh, you know, they're the best ones to do the job for the habitat because they've been bred to do that. So I think there's two things that we can do. There's little bits like that. We can start demonstrating how that can be done. Um, but also then you know, using that as a demonstration across wider areas and trying to get more people involved in doing it. So I think with the meadows, we're starting to change, we're starting to change opinions now, and I think people are starting to do it. Like I say, the, wildfla the, the uh, uh, Wildlife Trust have been doing it for a long time on a small scale. Small projects have been doing it in individual areas for a long time. Um, the Coronation Meadows project took that to a much wider audience as people started going, all oh, right, okay. You know, it, it's not difficult. It can be done. Um, it's just also, I think the seed, the seed companies are very good at marketing. You know? So they, you know, it's that idea, yeah, I want to do, I personally, I want to do something. I want to take my packet of seed and sow it for pollinators. And, and that's a very powerful motive. That's something that, that's really difficult to, to change. But yeah, there are ways of doing it slowly, I think. It'll take quite a while. <laughs> there's a lot of evidence of, of uh, mobile species moving around, and there's a little bit of evidence of, of plant species moving around. So, <coughs> pardon me, we are starting to see mobile species like bee orchids, pyramidal orchids, and things starting to, to, to move northwards in response to, to climate change, along with you know, many other famous things like common butterflies moving around. Um, one of the plants that we work on is something called uh, Meadow Clary, and there are just five or six sites of this left in Oxfordshire, and it produces really big, fat seeds. 
um, that are transported around by ants. So that's not very far. We worked out that for it to get, it, it, it was put into a model where its climate space was mapped. So this is predicting where, because uh, it's a warm European species, where it would move to in Britain. And we worked out that it would take something like seven, 8,000 years to reach that space, purely because that's how far an ant walks before <laughs> dropping the seed. So I think we need to have a bit of a reali realism check on how these things are actually moving around the countryside. And in fact, that's a really important point. A lot of the plants don't move because we've lost the vectors. We've lost those things that move them around the countryside. One of the other ways that we can improve meadows and get species back into meadows is to move cows around the countryside. And we've done this at our Jones Hill Reserve, where we had a series of 10 or 12 fields. And we always used to graze the livestock in, in the same fields. But then we started moving them around. And uh, the plants followed them. You know, they came in their dung and on their hooves and started moving, moving them around. One of the reasons why we've lost some species, particularly woodland species, is that we don't have wild boar in this country anymore. Wild boar do a very, very good job of moving things around the countryside. So we've got a very static, static sort of, you know, we've, no, we've got a very mobile flora, but it's not as mobile as, as it probably could, could be. I think it's fascinating to look at the, the, the debate about climate change and the, if everybody's planning for climate change. Everybody's, you know, we've got the Woodland Trust at the moment and other organisations, Forestry Commission, saying oh, we need to be planting southern European species into our woodlands now because that will be better in the future. No, 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 for goodness sake, why don't we just let the plants that are here do those natural processes? It'll be snow, it'll be slow, but let them do that natural thing because then we'll end up with something that is more resilient to change and can cope, cope better. So again, we've got a slightly odd attitude. And to me, whenever anybody talks about climate change, you know, I'm afraid you know, the biggest challenge to plants and to plant conservation is the farmer with his plough tomorrow who will go out and plough up Muka Meadows. You know, that's the biggest challenge. That's what we should be tackling at the moment. Yes, we can plan for the future, and we should plan for the future, but it's that day-to-day -day loss of, of, of wild plants that's, that's really important. Right. Dare we mention GM modifications in that? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, and I'm not going to, to be honest, if I can be, if I can be frank, mainly because... GM is, 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 is an issue really associated with, with crop plants and crop pro productivity. There is an issue with the, the, gen, uh, with, with the genes for um, herbicide resistance and, and disease resistance getting out into our wild crop relatives, but at the moment there isn't an awful lot of evidence there that says that's going to happen or has happened. We're watching the situation carefully and we're looking at how it will affect wild plant populations but as an organisation, we're not involved in that debate with, with, with crop plants because that's to do with, with productivity within the farm ecosystem. So I'm going to sidestep that little one if I can for, to for tonight. One more? Yes, Jamie. How are you going to do follow-up on um, what you were saying a few minutes ago about um, allowing native plants to adapt to climate change and have adapt to conscious So I'll turn that on its head and say, why do you want to move things around? Well, I'm thinking in terms of preserving the legal function. I'm not particularly strongly advocating either way. I'm just picking your brain on it. Yeah, I think, I think it, it, it's an interesting one because, you know, you know, I could ask, I could ask anybody in this audience, what's this climate going to look like in 50 years' time? And we've got some guesses, we've got some ideas. Do we actually know? It might be a little bit warmer. We might go a little bit cooler. We'll certainly probably go a bit wetter. We'll go a bit stormier. But we don't actually know what's going to happen in 50, 100 years' time. So imagining that we know what's going to happen and then planning for that future, imagined future, and doing something about it 
is as bonkers as shipping trees to Europe to get infected and bring them, them back over here. You know, what we should be doing is making sure that those remaining fragments of habitat that we've got left are in good condition, that they're as diverse as possible with as many species as possible, and that they're connected up as possible. And by connected up, I don't mean stupid little lines across the landscape thinking, oh, this plant can move down this hedgerow into the next woodland. We're talking about big blocks of habitat. So if you're trying to increase woodland, increase woodland around it. You know, there's been, for years, we've been talking about these corridors and, and, and lines across the landscape. Well, I'm sorry, plants don't move like that. They move into their immediate surroundings. They don't move all over the landscape. So we've got to make sure that we've got bigger blocks of habitat and really good quality habitat that's managed very well with as many species you know, uh, within it as possible, keeping, retaining that, that diversity. When we've got that, those habitats are in a fit state to deal with whatever the climate will, will throw at them. And I'd much rather live in a landscape that has adapted to that habitat by itself than deciding to plant North American oak trees across uh, Wales uh, in vast numbers, having some strange oak forests around and then finding some disease comes in and wipes them out because they're all one clone. So it's about... <laughs> yeah. Well, great questions. Uh, very incisive and satisfying answers. Thank you, Trevor. Before the vote of thanks, I want to give you a moment to say quickly about your uh, marathon. Yes, so I'm running the marathon. There's 26 extinct plants, flowering plants in Britain. So I'm doing a mile for every single one of them. The way my hip is hurting at the moment, I might only get up to <laughs> species number five or six, I think. Um, but yeah, I'm running the London Marathon uh, uh, in the middle of April. Um, so you can either go to the website there, uh, just giving Trevor the Botanist uh, and donate there, or indeed buy a raffle ticket. And I think we can have a, a raffle at the, at the end of the evening. So yeah, I'll just leave that up for now. Thank you. We are indeed. <coughs> so don't, don't go without buying a raffle ticket, and we'll make sure <laughs> about five or ten minutes. But the last thing, the most important thing, is the vote of thanks, and I'd like to call upon Professor John Good uh, to do that honour. If you'd like to come forward, John, thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. I should just explain that it's a tradition of the uh, Len Beer Lecture that the organisation which isn't uh, organising the lecture in that year gives the vote of thanks, uh, where, whereas the one that is introduces the speaker. So that's why I'm here before you tonight because I'm the moment the chairman of the North Wales Group of the Alpine Garden Society. Now Trevor. <laughs> the first time I ever set eyes on Trevor was about, I've been sitting up there trying to work out, 25 years ago I should yeah, think, and this yeah. Yeah. was being produced. And Trevor was but a callow youth, I think it's fair <laughs> to say. And there was a tap, tap, tap on my door and he appeared looking, I hate to say it, I hate people who stay looking young, but he hasn't <laughs> changed at all. He was tapping on my door and saying, I gather you might have a, a little tiny piece of desk space that I could use, and maybe a small access to the computers in your department. I was the director of the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology at the time. Uh, I won't be any trouble at all, you will hardly know I'm here. <laughs> And the reason was he wanted to work on the data. And of course, uh, some of his uh, collaborators on this were members of our CEH staff, particularly down at Monk's Wood in Cambridgeshire, which uh, sadly exists no more. Banger does. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, the first two parts of, those, uh, of that uh, request, he stuck too rigidly. He sat in a very small space and I don't think he particularly caused our computers to crash at any time. But as you can imagine, he, the, the one about, you'll hardly know I'm here at all, didn't <laughs> quite work out. I remember thinking at the time, the first time I saw him, he, was, he had that boundless enthusiasm, which for me is more important in life than any other thing. You can have brains by the millions, you can have ideas, by the score, but you've got to have, to really make a, a mark in life, I think, boundless enthusiasm, and that's what Trevor's got, and that's why he's where he is today, and that's why we've had such a wonderful lecture this evening. I'm sure you'll all agree with that. Now, 
I don't want to say much more because it was such a comprehensive review, really, of conservation issues and approaches to conservation management that my head really is quite buzzing. And I've been involved professionally in this area all my life. So, uh, I mean, there were things, I'm a woodland ecologist, and some of the things you, some of the, the, the problems in woodland management that you were talking about, I thought we tried to solve 40 years ago. But of course, these things come around again, don't they? And people forget lessons that are being learned. I don't think Wally Shaw's here tonight, but Wally Shaw worked on oak management in North Wales in the 1960s, 70s period, and showed many of the, uh, showed many of the things which you were talking about in relation to native woodland management. Uh, but really, it was just a cornucopia, wasn't it, of ideas, of wonderful pictures, wonderful illustrations, and as I say, all underpinned by that wonderful enthusiasm. And look at all the people here tonight. I'm sure you'll all go home and think, wow, that really, I really learned something tonight. And I really heard a person who knows what he wants, knows what he thinks, and by God, he's going to try his very best to get here. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you very much, John. That's very kind. Thank you. And I remember that office. I remember pouring through that data, reams and reams and reams of paper yeah, to, produce, to produce the atlas. When this was published, the Daily Telegraph reviewed it and likened it to a, a small bag of garden compost. <laughs> I think they were referring to the weight and not the content between the pages, but yes, absolutely. Right, I think... Yeah, if people are happy, we'll take the raffle now. So with, there's some prizes.